thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the organisers for inviting me here to sunny Switzerland, which is a good thing. Um, so I'm going to present this afternoon some collaborative work um, that builds on some work that we published a couple of years ago and starts to look at what the biological implications of that are. Um, so there's kind of one thread that's going to run through the whole of this. So some of it's quite new. A lot of you, well, a couple of you have heard this before, but for a lot of you, it's going to be new. So if you get stuck and it doesn't make sense, please ask. Otherwise, nothing from that point onwards will make sense. Um, and then we'll keep the sort of, have you thought about the biology stuff to later on, because I'm going to get to that. So I don't think I need to tell anybody in this audience that cancer genome uh, studies have taught us a lot about uh, cancer biology. And um, they're very complex processes that involve a combination of uh, damage to people or tissues or cells, and then the repair processes that kick in to try and solve those problems. And we've learned a lot from human, can human cancer data sets about um, how those tumours evolve. Um, but humans are intrinsically heterogeneous. We've all got different germlines. Some of us have got um, specific changes that make us more susceptible to certain diseases. And we've all exposed ourselves to different mutagens over the course of our lifetime, whether that's the sunshine or the wine or things we do in our jobs that mean that we all get damaged in different ways. And so when we look at tumor genomes, what we see is a combination of what was in our genome to start with and also how we've damaged it and how we've tried to repair that. And so there can be limitations in using human data to do that. So what we did was we took an experimental approach to this in order to rerun cancer evolution hundreds of times. And as a result of that, we've learned some quite cool stuff about biology. And it also has implications for um, ways that other people look at cancer genomes and challenges some of the assumptions that we make. So I apologize, the pointer is not working, so I'm gonna have to just use the mouse, but um, we, have a mouse experiment where we expose 15-day-old uh, mice to a chemical called diethyl nitrosamine. So we're going to call that DEN. And uh, we take control samples from those mice, so we have normal liver. And then we wait for 25 weeks until these mice develop tumours. And then we take the tumours out and we see what they look like. So this enables us to have an identical genetic background. These are inbred mice. We use a single hit of one carcinogen to induce the tumours, so they've all had exactly the same exposure. And because we know how this chemical works, we know what the cell of origin is of the tumours that arise. So just to show you what these look like, this is one liver that comes out of the mice, so they get lots of different tumours. Um, and so there's great big huge ones like this and smaller ones. And then there's also some background liver. So looking at the histology of what that looks like, this is normal liver. It's got a really ordered architecture that you can see on the reticulin staining and then chi67 which is a proliferative marker doesn't really um, come up very much then the, the dysplastic nodules so these are the early lesions they're a bit more disrupted architecturally and they're a bit more proliferative and then in these hcc's which are hepatocellular carcinomas they're much more aggressive looking um, microscopically the architecture is completely distorted and they're much more proliferative and from some previous work that we've done, we know that these tumours are independent. So this isn't one HCC with multiple intrahepatic metastases. They're independent tumours, which means we can take them each as a separate sample and we can use less mice in the experiment. So the data sets that we're working with here are um, some RNA-seq, ChIP-seq and ATAC-seq from the normal samples. And then from the tumours, we've got whole genomes, we've got RNA-seq and we have the images that we've done some image analysis work on. And then we've tried to bring all of those things together and try and learn from the different data sets what we can kind of try and take forwards in terms of biology. I obviously can't talk about all of this this afternoon, so I'm going to um, focus on what we've done with the whole genomes and looking at mutational patterns, what's going on at some of the regulatory sites and some of the dynamics of uh, transcription coupled repair. So first of all, looking at the mutations, we started with the basics. How many mutations are there and what do these mutations look like? So you can see the mutation rate is quite variable. So this is working with 371 tumours. The mutation rate is quite variable, but on average there's about 13 mutations per megabase. Sarah, can I ask you something? Yeah, of course. Uh, do you get only tumours in the liver? Uh, when we deliver the drug like this, yes. So they get an intraperitoneal dose of the drug and that, yeah, so it's absorbed straight into the portal system and hits the liver. 
um, but you can induce different tumours, so people use it for esophageal cancer, which you'll be familiar with that data set, yeah, yeah. Um, so with that, you use, you either put it in the drinking water or you do oral lavage. On how you deliver? Yeah. So the data you have, can you go back to that? So, so uh, Gypsy, can that taxi? Yep. You don't have that for the tumours? We don't have it in this tumour cohort, no. Only RNA, oh, whole genome sequence. Yeah, in the tumours we have whole genomes, RNA-seq and the image work. Why? Uh, because at the point we did the experiments, the amount of tissue that you... So these tumours are maybe one or two millimetres in size. So we're taking out a two millimetre piece of tumour, we're cutting it in half. We want to do whole genomes and transcriptomes in one half. We want to do image analysis from the other half. And there's not a lot left to do. <laughs> Gypsy can and much more than that. So, um, so yes, it's an obvious thing that we don't have, but we don't. Um, so, yeah, so the mutation rate is comparable to what you see in human cancer data sets that are driven by exogenous mutagens. So melanoma and lung cancer typically have in the region of this many mutations. And then this is the mutational signature that we get. Um, so just the standard way that you do cosmic signatures. And I assume everyone here is happy with trinucleotide context and how that's worked out. Yeah. Um, so you can see that the vast majority of these mutations are thymine to something mutations. So lots of T to A, but really all of the thymine mutations are sitting there. And this becomes important for how we work out what's going on. So the vast majority of DEN mutations are at thymine basis. So the reference genome, we think of as a single string of letters. We're all familiar with that. We all work with genomes. We know how this works. And I've told you that thymine is what gets mutated. So these are all of the nucleotides that are susceptible to damage by DEN. But of course, DNA is double-stranded. And so on the reverse complement, every time there's an A, there's going to be a T on the reverse complement. And everything else aside, DEN doesn't know which strand of the DNA it's going to be damaging. So actually, that means that every time you get a T or an A in the reference genome, that's potentially can be damaged by DEN. So then we sequence our tumours and call our variants. And so the black letters here above are the variants that we've called in this tumour. And when you look more closely, you can see that they line up with T's and A's. And then when you look even more closely, you can see that actually you get these runs of mutations in a row where they all line up next to a T on the reference genome. So this is on the forward strand. So we say that this whole region of the chromosome is forward biased. And then you get other regions where the mutations seem to line up against T's on the reverse complement, so they're A's on the reference genome. And so we say that this is reverse biased because it's T's on the reverse strand that seem to be being mutated. So we get these whole runs of mutations as you go along the genome, and these runs can be the entire length of a chromosome. They're not small regions, they're huge, great big regions of the genome. This is obviously a very zoomed in look, but if we look at what's going on genome-wide, this is the mutations from one tumour. So we have about 60,000 SNBs, we don't really get copy number changes in these tumours to the point that we ignore it. So we've got about 60,000 mutations. And just to walk you through what we've got here, if you look to start with at the blue points up here, so all of these are T mutations on the forward strand. And so the x-axis is obviously your, geno your genomic coordinates. So you've got your chromosomes off, above, along the bottom. And then the y-axis is the distance from that mutation to the closest T mutation. So it's a standard rainfall plot. And then underneath in gold, sorry, it would be easier with a pointer. Um, underneath in gold, you have exactly the same, but these are for A mutations. So T's on the reverse strand. And you can see that you get these chunks. So if we look at this particular tumor in chromosome 15, all of the mutations or almost all the mutations seem to be up here. There's thousands of mutations on chromosome 15 on the forward strand and almost none on the reverse strand. So we say this whole chromosome is uh, forward biased or Watson strand biased. And we summarize that with this blue bar. So this whole chromosome is what is Watson biased. Then on chromosome 17 here, we've got exactly the opposite. So almost, almost all of these mutations are on the reverse strand and almost none on the forward strand. So we say this whole chromosome is reverse biased or crick biased. 
And then the third scenario is what you get on chromosome 19 here, where you've got mutations on both strands of the DNA. And so I should have said the, on the previous one, we summarize these regions with a yellow bar, and then these ones that are balanced have a white bar. So then we can summarize, this is how we summarize the data across this whole genome is in a ribbon plot. So you get whole chromosomes that are either Watson biased or Crick biased or unbiased. So that's how we summarize the data for one tumor. And then you can look at all of them together. So this is each row here is one tumor. The one with the purple triangle is the one that you've just seen. And you can see that in all of the tumors, you get this chromosome scale strand asymmetric distribution of mutations across the genome. So this was completely unexpected. We spent quite a lot of time trying to make sure that this was actually real and not some kind of weird thing in the analysis. Um, it was Martin Taylor, who's in Edinburgh, who found this, and he was very excited about it and eventually convinced us all that it was real. Um, so how do we explain this? What, what's going on that gives us these weird asymmetries? Because we tend to assume that that's not happening. So what we did was we've called it lesion segregation, and it's about how the lesions that are caused in the early events segregate over the course of tumorigenesis. So I'm gonna explain this using the haploid X chromosome. These are male mice, so they all have one X chromosome, one Y. So if we just think about this as being the X chromosome, so it's double-stranded DNA. This is not two, allele, two separate chromosomes, it's two strands of DNA on one chromosome. So we damage our DNA with DEN, and you get adducts. So these are not mutations yet, they're DNA adducts where you've got an alkylate, so it's an alkylating agent, it binds onto the DNA at specific places. So you've got lesions that are going to be on the blue strand, so that's the Watson strand, and you've got other lesions that are gonna be on the Crick strand. And there's no, there's no reason to think that there's gonna be any particular correlation between those apart from at specific sites. So then during repli replication, what happens is that this lesion here these lesions will replicate and you end up with lesion mutation duplexes. So as the replication machinery moves along, it gets to a lesion, so it can't see that base anymore and it's gonna put in potentially a wrong base opposite that. So you get these lesion mutation duplexes, one for the Watson strand, one for the Crick strand, and then these are gonna end up segregating into separate cells. And some of these lesions will obviously get repaired, some of these cells will die, but the lesions that persist through cell division will then have to replicate again. So this is now in a separate cell. And when it replicates, these lesions are gonna produce new mutation duplexes. Whereas these mutations on this strand are going to replicate with high fidelity because they're just the wrong base. There's, nothing, there's no adduct there, it's just the wrong base. When it replicates, it's going to just put the right wrong base opposite. So then again, in the next cell cycle, the same thing's gonna happen again. These lesions have still persisted, they're gonna sorry, here, they still persisted, they're gonna generate new mutations. These fixed ones will generate fixed mutations. And on this side, these fixed mutations are now gonna persist through the whole of every subsequent cell division. And if you get a driver gene, then that cell line is gonna have a selective advantage. And so that's what this asterisk is meant to be, is a driver event happening all the way back here. And this will expand as a clonal population. But that means all of the mutations that end up in this tumor have arisen from this strand of DNA. And the ones that arose from this strand of DNA end up being diluted out because there's, there's no selective advantage to those cells. And because this is going on independently at each cell division for each chromosome, it's a way that you end up with combinatorial genetic diversity in these tumors. So we don't get whole tumors that are Watson biased and whole tumors that are Crick biased. We get ones where the whole chromosomes are biased, but not the whole tumor because this segregation and shuffling will happen at each cell division. So this is a way that at a large scale with chromosomes, you get heterogeneity within the tumors, but you also get heterogeneity at a much more fine scale resolution. So this is basically exactly the same process, but instead of looking at whole chromosomes, we're gonna just look at one lesion on one strand. So here, on the reference allele, so this is our reference here, and this is an A. So we have an A on the Watson strand, and we end up with a DNA adduct on this T, opposite the A. And then during replication, this lesion still exists. This is still a mutation. Uh, sorry, not a mutation. Not a mutation, it's a lesion. 
um, and it ends up putting in a mutated base opposite. So this G is obviously the wrong thing to be opposite a T. Then during the next cell division, what's going to happen is that this G, which is a high fidelity site, is going to end up still being a G and a C will get put in opposite. And this is going to look like normal DNA to the cell. There's no reason for it to know that that's wrong. Whereas on this side, where you've got a T with the lesions, this is the same lesion that continues to persist. And this time, instead of putting in a G, it's picked a T instead. It doesn't know what the right thing is, so it just puts in something else. And then in the next cell division, these fixed mutations are going to just continue to replicate, as you would expect. Whereas this lesion here, this time it's decided to put in a C instead. And this T will now have an A. So this relies on these lesions persisting through cell division. And what you end up with is what we call multi-allelic sites. So the reference is an A, but when you sequence all of this together, you're going to call all of these different variants. And typically what we do when we sequence tumors is we have the reference we call a variant. So we call the alternate allele. And then we say that's what the mutation is. So for this tumor, we would say it was a G because the, the majority of the non-reference reads are G. So we would just say that it was an A to G mutation and often filter out these other multi-allelic reads. Whereas actually what's going on or what you would predict from this model is that you would get loads of multi-allelic sites. Every time a lesion would persist, you would get the reference and alternate an alternate, alternate, an alternate, alternate, alternate. Sometimes it will put in the right base. And if that was true, then we would see it in our tumors. And obviously it is, otherwise I wouldn't tell you about it. And so what we see is that about 8% of our mutated sites, we have multi-allelic variation. And so that means that you get multiple different alleles being seen. And this is what it looks like in our real data. So we've got 150 base pair, 150 base pair paired end read data for these tumors. So here, if you imagine that the reference, as we've just seen, so this would be two A's, two orange alleles. And typically what we think about happening is that you get your reference and then all of the reads at this site are G. So they're just the other one. So we would, that's kind of what we think of happening. Whereas what we see is that in the same read, so we know this is definitely on the same strand because it's in the same read. And actually you can see all the combinations popping up. And then this is what we call a biallelic site where the reference again would be two orange ones. And although there's only two different nucleotides being mutated here, it's only A's and T's, because we can see that this is happening in, in the same sequencing read, there's no way under a sort of typical model of clonal expansion and according to Muller's ratchet that you would be able to get all of these combinations of mutations happening in the same tumor, and we know they are because they're on the same read. So we think this is quite cool, and it's something that we can use in terms of looking at the biology of what's going on. So from this first part, um, we have shown that at a large scale, we get combinatorial genetic diversity of whole chromosomes with mutational biases segregating between cells. And also we get multi-allelic genetic diversity at specific loci that have got multiple different variants occurring at the same site. And so from this, we can infer the strandedness of which, so which strand the mutation is happening on. And we can also calculate the multi-allelic variant rate. And so that's separate from just what the mutation rate is. We can look at how many, what proportion of all the mutations are multi-allelic. Okay, some people are looking a bit. Uh, I want to ask a question. Yeah. So, if it happens uh, because of those lesions, why not like, almost all the variants are multi allelic? Uh, so, a lot of the lesions will not continue to persist. And if a lesion is repaired very early on, which I'll show you in a sec, um, if the lesion is repaired and removed before replication happens, which is what's that's what's meant to happen. So you're meant to get repair of those lesions so that they don't persist through. Um, Only some of the lesions persist. But, but yeah, not all of them do. Okay, um, so we think these patterns are quite cool, but everyone then immediately says, well, how is this translational? What does it mean? Is it useful? Can we learn anything from this? Um, and particularly, does this have anything to do with human cancer? Because that's what everyone wants to know about. 
So I, I'm not going to show you the data unless anyone's particularly interested in it. So one thing that we did do quite early on was we looked at some of Serena Nix and Al's data where they treated human iPS cells with about 70 different mutagens. And in all of their cell lines, they did the same thing. So they got treated once with chemotherapy agents, with UV light, with all sorts of different things. And in all of their data where there's enough mutations to actually have power to do it, you see this chromosome scale segregation of lesions, uh, of mutations in all of these agents in human cell lines. And we also see it in, um, when we looked at all of the ICGC data, you see it in liver tumors, you see it in kidney cancers, you see it in lots of different things, but particularly in liver and kidney. And the reason for that is when you actually look at the cosmic signatures of what's going on in there, they tend to be tumors that have been driven by a particular exposure. So something like aflatoxin or people who've worked in chemical industries where they've been exposed to things. And so you can track back when that exposure happened according to what's going on in terms of their mutations. Um, and one of the things that we can do with this is start to look at the interplay of DNA damage and repair. Because we know that, as we said before, the tumor is a mixture of the, the damage that's happened and the repair that's happened as, in response to that. And those things are correlated and it's one of these correlation causation things correlated with replication, with transcription, with chromatin state, with DNA protein binding, but all of those things are interrelated. And so it's very difficult to separate out what's causing what. Yeah. But this pattern is totally dependent on having all the mutations at once. So the signal is strongest when it's all at once, yes. I would say that if you, in a tumor, mm -hmm. human tumor, you get mutations through time, you shouldn't see this. So because you need to have mutations already there to hitchhike, right? Into these drivers, so you get all these chromosomes, otherwise you don't get it. Yeah, so when you see the really strong signal, we think that it's one particular exposure that has kind of kicked things forwards, even if there was a predisposed state. Um, and so it's why we think it, we see it most clearly in things that have been one particular exposure. So we know that, um, so when you look at the, the cell line data for UV damage, it has a really strong signal, but you don't see it in melanoma because you get multiple, multiple, multiple exposures. So biologically it's going on, but every time you expose again, you essentially half the run, run length because you damage again and then it separates again. And so biologically it's going on, but you don't see it as the, as the final result. But yeah, to see it most clearly, you need one. One big shot. One big shot, mutation. yeah. Um, but the multi-allelic sites can still happen because as long as a lesion persists, it can continue to generate the multi-allelic sites for, yeah, as long as it doesn't do, get repaired. Example, in my, in this experiment, you reduce the doses of the, whatever, of the agent that you mm -hmm. use and then you, through time, so the, the, the time of exposition is much longer, you, it would dilute quite yeah. a bit all these things. But even the multi-allelic, no, it will be less frequent. Yes. That's my prediction. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's dependent on a particular scenario, which yeah. is a bunch of mutations at once, no? and a catastrophe. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, you think even if it's a continuous Yeah, but the, less, the lesion wouldn't have so many... Uh, it would... You know, if you give more time, more chances are for the lesion to disappear or to be repaired. Right? Isn't that the right? Yeah, because I... The expectation would be that you wouldn't see the bath would be a little bit more, you know, towards two allele something. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, le the lesions can, the lesions can persist. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, so one of the reasons we do this in young mice is there's such a proliferative pressure for these cells to continue to divide. Whereas if you do it in older mice, there's less pressure. And so those lesions will get repaired more efficient. There's less chance that a tumor develops from something that's got okay, lesions in it. Yeah. So, repairing. So, I, I'm not clear. Did you find comparable things in some human tumors, you said? Right? Yes. 
And so can you trace them back whether these were actually exposed to acute dose of mutagens, I don't know, for some accidents or something, uh, as compared instead to tumors that were not? So in terms of the ICGC data, obviously that's limited in terms of clinical history that we can get to, but there are a small number of tumors that um, the Sanger sequenced for a completely different project that they can see it and then they've been able to go back through records and all that stuff. So we don't know absolutely sh for sure, but we have two patients that we know that they worked in places that could have given them aflatoxin exposure and they have that signature. Yes. So what we think is that in that scenario, there's, for whatever reason, it may be that something else happened at the same time, but in the cell division that was the one that becomes the oncogenic point onwards, there was exposure at that point. Um, yeah. So you mentioned the back of the lung, it was mm. kidney and liver, was it, for the two kidneys? Others are the strongest ones. We do see it in other things as well, but... And can I ask... Um, what proportion of kidney cancers display this, this phenotype? Um, and is it like is 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 it the um, papillaries of the clear cell? No, so it's a, it's a small minority, and really, it's we're not trying to say that that's what it's about. Um, but it's not correlated with histological subtype. Um, and the numbers, I think, would be too small to be able to be to say anything significant on that anyway. Um, for the kidney ones, the livers, there's more, but then they're all HCC because that's, they all get lumped together. Okay. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is then go through some of these processes that influence the biases between damage and repair. So replication, transcription, chromatin state, and DNA binding. And then now that we know about strand res strand resolved re resolution and multi allelic sites, try and see what we can actually tease out in terms of what really is increased damage versus what is increased repair or vice versa. Um, so just to show you to start with, so um, now that we know whether something is, which strand it's on, we can get much better resolution at what things like mutational signatures look like. So this is the This is the signature that I showed you before, and we said that these are all T mutations. But of course, the way that we typically look at cosmic signatures is that we lump all of the Ts and the As together because we don't know which way round they are. And likewise, with the Cs and Gs, we shove them all together. So now what we can do is unfold these, and we have 192 combinations to play with. And so this is exactly the same signature, but shown with better resolution. So the sum of these As and Ts is what we're actually looking at here and you can see the vast majority are T's but there are some A mutations that are going on. Um, so then looking at replication, um, so DNA replication of undamaged DNA should be symmetrical um, but we know that with bulky adducts like UV dipyrimidine dimers there's, there becomes an asymmetry to, to that and so we wanted to see whether or not we could see what goes on with these smaller adducts and how that fits with um, damage and repair. So there's lots of different reasons that it could be asymmetrical if you have lesions there. Um, so there are different enzymes involved for the leading and lagging strand. And so they could have different um, misincorporation profiles or create different mutations. Um, the leading strand synthesizes continuously, whereas the lagging strand is discontinuous. And so that also means that you in terms of lesion bypass, if the replication can just skip over the lesion because they're different enzymes um, and they're happening, one is continuous and one is discontinuous, there might be differences there. And even if the lesion does cause the enzymes to stop, then they may recruit different uh, translesion synthesis pathways to take things forward. So there's lots of different things going on. And if any of those are different, then you might see changes in response to that. So. What it looks like initially, um, so we're down here, is that it looks like the lagging strand always has a higher mutation rate. So this is using 
looking at replication fork directionality, and then the mutation rate is on the um, y-axis. And looking at the forward strand, this is the lagging synthesis, and the reverse strand, lagging synthesis, both seem to have a higher mutation rate. But um, the direction of transcription also correlates with replication fork directionality. And so what we did was, so this data and this data are the same. So instead of having one running five prime to three prime and one three prime to five prime, we flipped them round and made them point in the same direction and overlaid them. And then looked at, given that this is about transcription, looked at the genic regions and the non-genic regions. And so these non-genic regions, which are not going to be repaired, are completely symmetric, completely flat. So there's no repair going on here. Um, and the mutation rate is constant, whereas actually everything lines up along here. And so really any of the asymmetry that we're seeing is because of transcription rather than the replication which is not necessarily completely unexpected, but we just didn't know. Um, so given that this seems to be explained by transcription coupled repair, we wanted to go on and look a bit in a bit more detail at what's going on with transcription. And just as a, this will be textbook to some of you, but new to some of you. So what happens in transcription coupled repair is, so this is your two strands of DNA, one is blue and one is yellow. And we, so if we look at gene one to start with, it's going to be transcribed in this direction. And so the non-template strand is the blue one, and that's the one that's going to be transcribed. So that's the gene that's gonna get expressed. And what happens during transcription coupled repair um, is that the enzymes come in and they start to strip off any lesions or mutations that are going on underneath where this gene is expressed. But this strand does not get repaired. It's the opposite one that gets repaired. And this is just how it works. So what you end up with, with the blue strand, is this region where, um, where the gene is doesn't get repaired, so you've got mutations. Whereas down here, all of the mutations have been removed. And so that looks normal. But what's happening on the opposite strand, so gene two is on the yellow strand. So it's going to be going in this direction and so you get the opposite. So these lesions won't get removed, whereas the ones on the blue one are gonna get removed underneath here. So that means you get these ones get removed and these ones don't get removed. And so, so this is just, this is how it works. So you get regions where you've got genes being expressed that you get repair and you get fewer mutations at those sites. And what this looks like if you take all of the uh, mutations together is um, so here we've, we've lined up all of the genes across all of the tumors and centered them on the transcription start site and then plotted the mutation right here. So low expression genes are not being expressed, so they're not being repaired, so they have a high mutation rate. So that is the gray ones up here. Whereas for high expression genes, so highly expressed genes are highly repaired and so if they're highly repaired, they'll have fewer mutations because they get got rid of. So this is exactly what you would expect. And this is what this is our data. This is what you see. So this was already known. But what we can now do is look at the two strands separately. So up at the top in the pale, pale gray and pale pink are the non-template and template strands for the low expression genes. And as you would expect, they sit on top of each other. They're not being expressed, so nothing's going on. Whereas for the high expression genes, it's completely different. And what we see is that the template strand, the red one down here, because that's the one that's going to be repaired, there's far more um, repair, so the mutation level drops right down. Whereas the one that's going to be being expressed, the non-template strand, actually bounces right back up because it's, it's not being repaired. And so although this is what you would predict, this has allowed us to show this in in real data. Okay. And Sarah, would this be the same that for protein coding and non coding? Right? Yeah. At that point, there's no difference, just the expression level. Um, so, as long as it's repaired by transcription coupled repair, it shouldn't. That. But your, your uh, 
pool of genes here? Yeah. Only protein coding genes or everything that is um, in this particular analysis, it's protein coding, but it is total RNA seq that we've got, so we can do that. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, when you come back to the previous or the second previous slide, I, uh, when there was this, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, so this uh, polymerase only removes the lesions; it doesn't do any other repairs. Uh, so there's different enzymes do different things. Um, in this context, it's about removing the lesions. Yeah, because I'm wondering, is it like uh, also valid for different sources of mutations? This mechanism. Uh, so there's different. So this is for nucleotide excision repair, but there's different things. So you get base excision repair, and you get different different mechanisms depending on what it, what the damage is that needs to be repaired. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is looking at all genes together as one aggregate summary. And what we can then do is, so this is the same data, but just looking at gene by gene. So in this plot here, uh, we've got transcription on the x-axis and mutation rate on the y-axis, and each dot is one gene. Um, so looking at whether we think the lesions on the template strand or the non-template strand. So what this, what this means is this flat, area up here has got a high mutation rate. So these correspond to essentially unexpressed genes, which is group one. These ones down here are highly repaired. So they're highly expressed genes that are being highly repaired, but they, it's become saturated. So there's a flat line and that's this group six here. And then group two, three, four, and five are quartiles of this group in between where the higher their transcription, the higher their repair and the effect on mutation rate. So this is just the categorized data so this is exactly the same, showing that the template strand, um, the mutation rate drops. But there is this reduction here. And so what we wondered is whether for the non-template strand lesions, where the mutation rate goes down, whether somehow this was transcription coupled repair, um, possibly antisense. And so that would, that would be accounting for this reduction in mutation rate. And so what we've done is we've looked at the signature of the repair. So comparing what we actually see to what you see in the unexpressed genes. And um, so these two groups here have got a similar mutation rate, but they are completely different in terms of their gene expression. And these signatures, uh, so this one corresponds to this one, this one corresponds to this one, these signatures are different. So it's not the signature of transcription coupled repair that's causing, um, it's not transcription coupled repair that's causing that. And we can look at this for each of the different, um, each of the different expression profiles. So this column here is all of the template strand lesions and they all show the same signature. So this is the signature of transcription coupled repair. Whereas on the opposite strand, it looks quite different. And so we think that although this repair is associated with transcription, it's not transcription coupled repair per se that's causing it. So that means that either there's increased surveillance of lesions on the non-template strand, or it means there's reduced damage occurring in the first place to transcriptionally active genes. And what we can do to look at that is to look at our multi-allelic sites. So this is what I showed you before. So this is how we generate multi-allelic variation in the tumors. And what happens during transcription coupled nucleotide excision repair is that after this first event, so there's a G inserted in error, but then nucleotide excision happens and this T lesion is removed. And then everything from here on are fixed mutations. And so what you end up with in the end is that if lesions persist all of the way through and they continue to persist, you get multi-allelic variation. Whereas if this lesion only persists for the first cell cycle before it gets repaired, you get biallelic variation. But the mutation rate in both of these scenarios is the same. So you've got the same number of mutations, but you have a difference in terms of the multi-allelic rate. And then we can essentially do a ratio of these two to see how early we think that that repair has happened. So if you have a small number of, if, it, if the mutation rate is the same, but you have a smaller number of uh, multi-allelic sites, it implies that repair happened earlier, so it's more efficient. Whereas if it happens later, then you have more multi-allelic sites. 
Um, and so we can, we can look at the combination of them to see what's happening. So this is back to the same plot. So this is our mutation rates based off this. And what we then did was look at the multi-allelic rates at the same sites. So this is now multi-allelic variation rather than mutation rate. And we see essentially the same pattern occurring. So for each of these strata, it's most uh, reduced in the template strand and it's still there, but less so for the non-template strand. And so that means that we think that this is, so the repair process is associated with transcription, but not transcription coupled repair. Um, and having excluded transcription coupled repair, it seems like this supports that more open chromatin of these active genes have got increased lesion surveillance rather than being damaged more. Um, so I have a couple more sections, but I think probably we're done on time, aren't we? Um, so I'll just go to my last couple of slides. Um, and so what I've shown you some of and not all of. <laughs> um, so we think that replication strand asymmetry can be explained by transcription coupled repair. Um, we can show that transcriptionally active loci have got enhanced repair of both strands and that accessible chromatin has lower mutation rate because of a more efficient repair than um, reduced damage occurring. And we've got a follow on from this stuff to come. Um, so obviously lots of people have been involved in this over a lot of years. Um, the original lesion segregation work, we did the experimental work in Duncan Odom's lab in Cambridge um, and he's now in Heidelberg. And then the analysis for all of the strand interaction stuff has been very much driven by uh, Martin Taylor, who's a PI at HGU in Edinburgh, and two of his postdocs, Craig and Lana, um, have done a lot of the work on it. And also other groups, so Nuria, um, as well as Paul Fleetcheck at EBI and Colin Sample in Edinburgh. And um, this is my lab, which is new and starting, um, but haven't really been involved in this work. Um, so yeah, any more questions? Um, I have two questions. First was when you talked about the uh, vision segregation and the chromosomes in this uh, combinatorial genetic diversity. Um, do you see a pattern of the same chromosomes always being forward strand or always being over strand bias, or is this completely random cross -combined? Um, so at a chromosome scale, it is essentially random. Um, but what we do see, so this is all 371 altogether. Um, and what we've got here is if you stack the biases, so all of the Watsons uh, would go up and all of the Cricks would go down. But if it was completely random, then you would expect it to sit along the blue line in the middle, but you get places where it deflects. And so the two most common driver genes that we see in these tumors are BRAF and HRAS. And so where you get a deflection away from the midpoint, then that suggests that there's a reason that that gets taken forwards. Um, so, so at a chromosome scale, no, but it's actually a way of identifying driver genes essentially. Um, if you have enough data from the same cohort, you can completely agnostically identify driver regions. Um, my second question is a little bit more speculative um, about uh, transcription coupled repair, but not really. Um, do you have any hypothesis how this happens? Because uh, there, there have been some papers recently that at least in double strand break repair, sometimes RNA gets used as a typical drug on the other strand. Do you think something similar could maybe happen in transcription coupled repair? Is this why you get a bit of a more accurate repair sometimes in the transcription reactive regions? Um, in terms of why there's repair on the non-template strand, or um, yeah, yeah, I'm saying like not using the other strand as a, 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 a template, but using R the RNA that's being produced as a template. Uh, I don't know is the honest answer, <laughs> but it's a good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not sure. One last question. I'd spawn on one slide on pass very fast about CGCF and loops. I was just wondering about that one. <laughs>
Yeah, so we've not really got loop data, um, but I can show you. I can show you what we've got on CTCF. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, no, it's really neat. The CTCF stuff. Um, so. Um, So this, hopefully we'll get a battery for the pointer, it will make life easier. So this is looking at the CTCF motif in the middle um, and then separate it out in terms of the two strands, so the C strand rich or the G strand rich and looking at um, the, which mutations are happening at which sites. And this position six mutation is the one that, always, that causes the really big spike um, in the middle of the mutation rate um, and uh, and also when we look at so that's obviously CTCF but we've looked at this for about 130 different transcription factors and if you look at the sites the most high information sites across all of those um, points you can see that so this is looking at the excess mutations that happen across the whole cohort at all of those high information sites. And the vast majority of them sit below here. So that means that they're being protected from mutations. Whereas you get this handful of sites that sit up here, these ones, and again, these ones from CTCF where you get increased mutation at those specific sites. Um, and we think there's two different things going on. Um, and one of them we think is probably, um, a bit like you see in some UV damage where you have to have ETS binding in order for those mutations to happen. And we don't know why, but we think this is probably another example of that happening where you need specific binding of a protein for the mutation to happen. And I don't know why, um, but that seems to be what's happening at those sites. And then the, the site nine stuff is, we think is different, but. And that's equally on the, the Watson and Crick strands. Um, it, if you, once they're orientated the same way, then yes. Yeah. Okay.